Good afternoon, Roy Oppenheim here for Zoom at noon. I know it's hard to believe, but this is the 13th consecutive week that we've been holding these, these webinars. Uh, this week, we're gonna be talking about the new normal single family rentals. I'd like to, of course, thank as usual, those people who assisted here today, uh, Paula Vergara, who helped put the slide deck together, Wendy Oppenheim, my daughter, as well as Ellen Kowalski, my law partner and wife, have been assisting with these productions, as well as my entire uh, legal staff. If we can go to the next page, please, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna be talking today about uh, weekly unemployment and the economic update, the PPP status update, a lot of new information there that's very important, uh, the pandemic update, and then of course, the development of this new real estate sector called the single family rental. Um, just as a way of background, those of you who know our firm and know me personally know that we've been uh, representing folks in Florida for really close to uh, 31 years now. And uh, during the last great recession, the economic crisis, we helped thousands of homeowners navigate uh, a situation where their homes fell in value, they were unemployed, we had to deal with the banks, there was a huge foreclosure crisis. And of course, we helped people figure out what to do uh, with their homes and kept literally thousands of people in their homes as, as we were able, in many cases, to beat up the banks and, and deal with the banks in such a way that people could stay in their homes with a short sale or a modification. This time around, this is a very different type of crisis. Many people lost their homes, had lost their jobs, not their homes, uh, very quickly in this particular situation. And as we'll see today, uh, we don't know which way uh, the economy is going, but we're going to be here as a firm to represent you all through this entire crisis. And uh, we're looking forward very much to, uh, to assist you in that way. Um, today, we're very fortunate that we have uh, Ardavan uh, Yakubi, and I, and I pray I pronounce Ardavan's uh, name. We always call him Artie. Uh, Artie, I've known, is a friend of the families. He's a PhD candidate from Princeton. He's an honor alumni from the University of Chicago. He studied at, at Oxford and he has vast experience in national and international real estate investment. Currently, Artivan is the principal at Cambier Management, an asset manager based in New York that invests in real estate uh, across various uh, uh, structures and liquidity spectrums. And so Artie, is, it's really a pleasure to have you join us. And I wanna make sure Artie's uh, volume, uh, uh, sound is on so he can chime in and then he'll, he'll take over. Sure. Roy, thank you so Artie. much for having me. I'm really excited. Great. Well, we're thrilled to have you too, and uh, the whole family sends their very best to you and, and to your family. Okay, let's go on if we can. Uh, our, our last discussion, as many of you recall, about uh, the different regions and, country, and countries are doing what they're doing to control the pandemic and the results uh, that we're seeing. This week, we're going to talk about uh, the panorama of our nation and its economic recession, as well uh, as the pandemic and, of course, the big social events, movements that, that, are, that are translating through this entire country right now. And, and how this is all going to affect the real estate market, and in, in particular, single family rentals, which is really a, a new construct and new concept that we're we'll talking about. Zillow, uh, can we go back to uh, Zillow said last time, uh, just recently in the commercial, it's, it's times like these that we understand uh, the, real, the, the real value of a home. And so this is, uh, you know, and a home takes on so many different contexts. And in the last crisis, when people were losing their houses, we were trying to explain to people, you may be losing your house, but you're not losing your home. And, how do you explain that to your kids? This is, of course, a, a completely different different crisis. And again, we're, we're here to, to help us all navigate this. So thank you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the weekly unemployment data because it's absolutely fascinating and, uh, and, and also confusing. Uh, the Department of Labor announced on Friday that uh, unemployment uh, had, had actually gone down to 13.3% from 14.7% in April. And the uh, stock market perceived it as a Pleasant surprise. I want to go on to the next slides, but it's absolutely fascinating. As I, as I had indicated, um, as we can see here, uh, if someone could take the mouse, uh, we saw that 22 million people lost uh, had, had gotten. We created an economy where, where 22 million jobs were created between 2011 and 2020. Uh, specifically, right here, we can see all the job creation that occurred right here, and um, and then we saw how many jobs were actually lost uh, in the month of March, a million three and then 20 million in uh, the month of, of April. And the surprise, of course, is that in the month of May, if we can just show that little uh, increase there, please. <clears throat> Go back. There's a little increase right here, uh, that will notch. Wait, you can see. Uh, why? They can't see the PowerPoint thing? Okay, I just noticed, oh, okay, can't see the mouse? Okay, anyway, if everyone can see at the bottom right, I thought this was a pointer, apologize. 
we can see that there's an increase of 2.5 million jobs in the month of May, which was somewhat of a, of a surprise uh, to the, I, I guess, to the pundits. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, the big issue, of course, is that even though they're saying unemployment is 13%, the real question is how that gets calculated, who's not in the labor force, who's looking for jobs, who's getting unemployment, who doesn't want to go back to job work necessarily because they're getting collecting unemployment, and that becomes a real issue. And the big issue, of course, are the folks who are being furloughed. I want to add that this is an interactive process. I expect people to have questions, to have comments. Uh, I, you know, Artivan and I can't can't do this for an hour unless there, there's some sort of feedback here. So, can I comment, Roy, on the previous? Uh, if you go back to slide nine for a second, thank you. Uh, I think this is a fantastic uh, to see this depicted visually. I mean, maybe one thing uh, would just be, I mean, 2.5 million rebound in May would suggest, you know, roughly call it 12 percent of the total job loss in one month. So perhaps what some people are projecting forward is that, you know, that month. 2.5 million is not that much relative to 20, 22, but if you sort of think that that'll continue for another six or seven months, we could be back sort of close to previous employment. So I think perhaps that's part of why people got so excited about the number. Uh, we have a question here. It's mystifying how the payroll estimate could be 10 million off from the actual number. Uh, we're kind of going to go through how, how that could be. Uh, you know, some people think it's somewhat nefarious, but uh, you know, I, I think that the uh, Department of, of Labor, you know, has statisticians and, and this is all new territory for them, too, of what you calculate and what you don't calculate. They, they have tried to correct it, but it doesn't seem like the markets really care. Next question. Uh, will this affect capitalism as we know it? You know, that's a political question and, and we're not here to discuss politics, even though Artie and I are both uh, students of politics. Artie actually was a PhD candidate in my very department, the Department of Politics, where I graduated from Princeton. But today, uh, I think we're, we're more like uh, the folks who are delivering information for you to come to your own conclusion. And uh, we're, we're the folks who are trying to uh, explain this view as opposed to give you our, our political views. So uh, I won't answer that question. Uh, uh, and we can go to the next slide. Artivan, you're welcome to, to chime in on that. But what do you think as it relates to, to capitalism? <laughs> above, my, above my pay grade, above my pay grade, right? Uh, most politicians get paid less than you, so maybe below your pay grade. Let's not go there. Uh, but the pandemic is is uh, okay. So let, okay. So, so the next thing we want to talk about is that you know if we if we look at the numbers, the number really isn't 13, 14, 15, 16, but you know it's close to 17.9 percent because we're not including people who are who are maybe afraid to go back to work, who are taking care of sick child, sick sick family members, or or are caring for children because you know school really hasn't been in session the way the way we know it. Another question. Uh, what do you think about the quality of jobs that came back? Job loss is really focused on retail and hospitality and white collar has been spared for the most part. But now we're seeing firms like Deloitte lay off huge swaths of, of, of their workforce. Um, it's gonna be interesting to see if the white collar folks are going to be able to replace their positions in white collar, or if in fact they're gonna have to take positions like being an Uber driver or working for Amazon, or if they can you know, find their own consulting gigs to do their own stuff. I mean, the problem is that the economy has slowed down and when an economy does slow down, by definition, there's, there's a contraction that goes on and the velocity of money slows down. And therefore, the kinds of jobs, whether it's big law firms or big accounting firms, have less business and less work for uh, their, you know, for their employees. Artie, any, any thoughts on that? Um, just the only thing to say here, again, not to be uh, too optimistic here, but given the difficulty of hiring in this environment where you can't really interview, you can't travel that easily, um, you know, maybe it suggests that the unemployment, uh, you know, numbers will get significantly better when people can actually travel and, and hire and have some certainty about their businesses going forward so they can actually allocate for, for you know, labor. I mean, I mean, what's interesting, we're seeing around the rest of the world that, that many parts of the world are opening up and things are almost normalized, whether it's Israel or Paris. You know, we're seeing videos and pictures of, of people going to the beach, going to restaurants, not wearing masks and not social distancing. And so if, in fact, that is in our near future, regardless of, of the pandemic, uh, then that would be optimistic. The real issue though, are we gonna see second spikes? But many of these places haven't yet seen these second spikes. And so it's gonna be kind of interesting to see what, what happens. I mean, there's, obviously it's gonna be two steps forward, one step back, but it's not gonna be just an upward, upward spiral like, like or, or staircase like you're suggesting. Uh, next slide. So if, if we take uh, you know everyone into account who's not working, including part-time people who want to go back to work, furloughed workers who weren't included in the original estimate, you know the 13, 14, 15 percent reaches closer to 24 percent, 
But of course, when we were at three percent, that probably would be more like five or seven. But but the real number right now is that people who would like to work or can work, you know, is closer to uh, 20, 24 percent. Okay, I think we're on to the next question. Are we on to a question? Yes. No, nope, not yet. Okay. Um, anyway, so if you combine all of these folks, we're not we're we're, we're talking about close to twenty seven. Okay, let's let's move on. Uh, okay, so that so we have some takeaways here. Uh, doesn't mean that the indications uh, recovery are false. It does. It means that the unemployment numbers are not a clear indication of real damage. We all know that unemployment numbers only give a part of the picture. Uh, by including unofficial uh, unemployed, it's still possible to realistically hope for a fast recovery compared to the sharp decline. You know, what's really interesting. Everyone's really talking about these V curves. You know, and, and we'll see with the stock market. We're starting to see that the question is. Will unemployment continue to be a V or is it going to be a U with some sort of tail? And so that, that's what, what we're going to be looking at. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So the real question is when did the current recession officially start? Most of you did hear that there, we are in a recession. So the question is when did the recession start? Did it start in January, February, March, or April? Uh, and many of you know the answer because you've read it, but many of you have, you know, it's, it's just a technical question. And so many of us would have thought that the, maybe uh, the recession started when the pandemic started, which would you know, normally be the, uh, the thought. But the, the response is 47 of you said in February, which is in fact the right answer. But many of you said 35, 12% said April, and a number of you said 6%. The reality is over half of us got it wrong. The pandemic uh, is not what actually triggered this recession, although it made it a lot worse, but officially uh, we were in a recession in February. But of course, had the pandemic not occurred, the subsequent quarters and, and, and economic injury wouldn't have allowed any dip in February to manifest itself into a recession. Because you're always looking through a rear view mirror when you're determining when, when a recession has occurred. Sorry, sorry, Roy, you didn't tell me this was gonna be a graded, a graded uh, Zoom. Can yeah, we well, that was, an, that, that, was, that, that was the easiest question of the bunch, so get ready. <laughs> and you're welcome to, to chime in. Um, but as I indicated, you know, there's good, when, as New York is reopening, you know, and, and being that the stock exchange is, is in New York, you know, we're starting to see that um, economy, at least from uh, a purely economic perspective, is, is, is starting to react, especially in terms of Dow Jones or, or the, uh, the S&P. Um, I thought you guys wanted me to go faster. So. Okay, but in terms of what is, uh, in terms of which, which markets, uh, you know, which sectors of the economy are doing particularly well, if we, if we look at the bottom, we're seeing that utilities aren't doing particularly well. Uh, Finance is doing okay, but at the top, we're seeing that retail is bouncing back. Technology services, commercial services, consumer uh, durables, those stocks are doing particularly well, in part because they were so beaten up and people had, had, had basically given up on, on those areas. And airlines, for example, you know, have, have done particularly well after doing so particularly poorly. And I say do well, doesn't mean that, that people are running back, but, but people are coming back, flights are full, middle seats that were previously left for social distancing are going to be given up by many of the airlines starting in July. JetBlue announced that just, I think, the other day. Um, and here's another, another V-shape. This is, this is the V-shape that, that we're seeing of, of the stock market. But before, we saw almost a triangle. And it's funny, it's almost not Vs. We're looking at triangles. We saw a triangle of how, how the economy, the, the, the uh, employment market had, had collapsed. Here we're seeing how Wall Street uh, is literally a, a, a V and, and is back to where it started. Uh, before the crisis in, in, in March. Um, next question. The 2.5 million new jobs in May is the largest one month increase since, and already maybe you know this answer, 2008, 2001, 1964, or 1948? And, uh, and the answer is, and let's see, uh, some people, ah, okay. So half of you got it right, and the other half got it wrong. So half of you had 1948, which is the answer, and uh, everyone else got it wrong. But since 1948, we have never created 2. Point some odd million jobs, 2.5 million jobs in one month. So that, that's kind of impressive. Um, next, PPP loan stats, very important. Many of you, uh, we had encouraged at the time that this was gonna be a, a, a gold rush, it's gonna be a mad rush to, to apply. And in fact, uh, the PPP program originally ran out of money, as many of you then know, there was a new allocation and there still is money right now. You must, have, you must be approved by June 30th, I mean, for those of you who have not applied, there's still time to apply, but you gotta get your application in now because if it's not approved by June 30th, technically it can get rejected. So you probably only have a few days to get it in because it probably would not get approved by, by the deadline. But here are the modifications for those of you are small businesses or no people who uh, took PPP money. And it's very important that, that we go over these. Borrowers may elect to extend the current period from which it was originally eight weeks 
to 24 weeks. That's critical because people couldn't get rid of their entire payroll or, or the entire sum of money in, in eight weeks because many folks had, had been closed. Borrowers then have five years to re repay the loan instead of two years. That makes it a lot more easy to repay the loan to the extent that it's not forgiven, but most of the loans, particularly under uh, a certain dollar amount, will, will be forgiven. I think that, that amounts to uh, uh, two and a half million. Uh, the interest rate remains exceptionally low, so of course it's a great deal at 1%. And then the initial payroll expenditure used to require that you spend 75% on payroll and 25% on very limited items such as rent or mortgage. Now it's 60% on payroll, 40% on other things, and those other things have been ex expanded. Uh, and borrowers may now use the extended period of 24 weeks to restore their workforce and wages to the, the pre-pandemic level. Before it used to be by June 30th, you had to restore it, and now you have till December 31 to restore it to pre-pandemic level. And then there are exceptions. If you can't restore your your, uh, your payroll to pre-pandemic levels of uh, between January 1 and February 15th, borrowers, borrowers can now find qualified, because you can't find qualified employees, or because you take the position that, for example, if you were a store and the store was shut because of stay-at-home orders, then in fact, you don't have to restore it yourself to, uh, to those levels and you have to explain why COVID-19 uh, was uh, literally inhibiting your business from, from, from existing or, or being able to operate and thus you'd be exempt from uh, restoring that the same number of, of employees. So. Uh, we'll be assisting lots of folks in, with those kinds of questions and have been, and it's our pleasure to continue doing that. Uh, additional clarifications to qualified payroll, cash compensation includes gross salary, gross tips, gross commissions, overtime, allowance, uh, and um, for those you know, self-employed, you cannot pay yourself more than $15,385, which is equivalent of eight weeks of salary uh, on a salary of $100,000. If you're self-employed, you pay yourself less than $100,000, you would not be limited to the eight weeks, but you could expand that to 24 weeks, but the cap of 15385, regardless if you paid that to yourself in eight weeks or through uh, you know, the 24 weeks, you still will not be able to take more than 15385 individually from the PPP program, which is interesting. Uh, additional clarification, personal property items such as copiers, common business items, I guess insurance, uh, those types of items can now be calculated as part of the 40%. Previously, uh, some of those items such as like a, a rental, copy or even a rental of an automobile or a lease, those could not be included in 25%. And then interest rate on real, on real and personal property, including equipment, automobiles, and other personal property is now part of that 40% calculation. So for most people, if they keep good books, they have a good accountant, good lawyer, they should be able to get most of your PPP forgiven, and that would be things. Roy, Roy, can I ask a question? I'm curious if you were to grade the PPP program, you know, on an A to F uh, ranking, what, how would you grade the overall program in terms of how it's how it's done. You know, I, I, I'm a pretty strong proponent of it. I was, you know, taken back substantially when public companies were going to the PPP when they could have gone to the Federal Reserve or, 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 or to their own banks or, or the public markets or bond markets to, to raise capital. So I felt that they were taking money from, from Main Street. But now that we're seeing that there's still, you know, billions and billions of dollars left for the PPP for, for small business, it's suggesting the program has, has been remarkably successful. Also, the stock market is, is a function of that. You know, when you pour one, two, three trillion dollars into the economy, obviously it's going to go somewhere. And so ultimately, if people are able to go out, they're going to start spending on restaurants and continue to, to buy stuff. I mean, Amazon is a major, major beneficiary of the PPP program, as is anyone who, who provides, you know, shop at home opportunities. And, and then anyone who's providing good opportunities like Walmart, where you just pull up and then just throw the stuff in the back of your car. I mean, I have a sneaky feeling that people are going to get used to it and they're going to get spoiled in some ways. They just, just kind of concierge service and would prefer not to walk into a Walmart and just have someone put the stuff in the back of your car. I mean, it's really kind of neat. Yeah. So I think well, seeing those, those kind of changes. Arva? Yeah, I, I just think that, you know, without taking a view about whether it's the right policy or not, I mean, it was interesting that we started in some of the debates, uh, mostly on the Democratic side, discussions around universal basic income and UBI which were seen you know, a year or two ago as being sort of way outside the mainstream. Uh, and then not only did they become the mainstream, it sort of uh, in a roundabout way ended up actually becoming policy. And I think that that's just, a, it's, a, it's an important change in how our government you know, interacts with fiscal policy. Um, and so I think that it's, it's something that will continue. To, I, I don't think this is the end of the innovation. I mean, I think the government has now created this structure and will probably find 
other ways of, of using it in the future. So it's no, something I, I, I think it's super important. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think what's so fascinating is that things that were perceived on the political spectrum as left or, 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 or from one political party have become mainstream overnight. And UBI is not a new concept. I think I've talked about this before, but are, you, you know how old the UBI construct is when it was first given envisioned in, in, in political textbooks? I don't, I don't know. Over 400 years ago. So if you, if you go back far enough, you'll see that the, the idea of, of giving people money so you stimulate the economy is not a new construct. And, and that it's a concept that, you know, all boats rise when, when there is enough of an economy to support it. So, so I think we're going to see more of that. I think you're right. And, um, you know, even, even concepts like Medicare for all, which, which were perceived originally as, as uh, you know, ludicrous. I mean, the reality is that anyone who had COVID basically got free Medicare. I mean, they're not going to end up in bankruptcy because they ended up with, with a pandemic, you know, uh, ailment. And so I think we're seeing a lot of that now with the uh, rental strikes and, and abatements of foreclosures, you know, we're seeing that, that, that the home ownership or, or at least having a residence is, is becoming somewhat of a, of, a, of a universal right. And so I think there, there's some major, major changes like we saw with the, new, with the, uh, with the you know, after the, the depression in the Great Society and FDR that we're going to see from the left and the right or, or from conservatives or, or liberals, certain constructs that we're going to need to, to preserve. And we can go to the next slide, uh, a certain amount of, of tranquility and, and peace in our, in our society. So, we're going to have lots of new challenges that, 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 that as a society we're going to have to deal with. And, and of course, one of the challenges we now have to deal with is, is trans, transition, transmission of disease, you know, between protests and opening up of, of society. And the question is, you know, will that set us back a stepper or will it, or will it not? But either way, as a, as a community and as a society, you know, I think we're going to see major transformation, uh, both economically and politically through, through the process. I mean, it is fascinating to be living during these times, that's all I can say. Uh, Again, you know, uh, we're going to see some interesting changes as, 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 uh, as Vegas opens up and as casinos back open up, and, and uh, we'll see what impact that's going to have on uh, on, on, on transmission. Um, Artie, I'm going to turn this over to you now. Uh, before that, are there any questions, or did I miss any, any polling questions? Or not? Okay. Are there any other questions from anyone? If you have any questions on what we what we just went through, I appreciate you all just just send them through. But Artie, why, why don't you take over on the development sure. of uh, the single family rental? And do you want me to switch to your slides? You know, do you want to take over? Um, the, if I could do the, if I can share my screen, I think I can. Let me click. Okay, can, can we share it? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, it actually says host disabled, so that's okay. I'll okay. voice over. That's quite all right. Um, so yeah, so just to frame this, first let me just sort of introduce myself and, and let everyone know uh, who just I am. Just speak louder. So, just speak a little louder. Oh sure, sure. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm I'm Ardavan Yugubi. I'm a principal at Combiar Management. Uh, we're we're a real estate investment firm based in New York uh, that we do things uh, in public and private markets. Uh, we have led an investment uh, on the private side in a single family rental uh, platform. Um, but I'm going to be speaking today just generally about what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, single family rental is a pretty small niche within uh, the world of real estate, as, as Roy mentioned. I think most people are familiar with uh, multifamily and apartments uh, and sort of garden style apartments or dense downtown apartments. Um, and single family rental, you know, I, I included a picture on the first slide just so everyone were on the same page. It is what it sounds like. It's uh, the, the rental of a single family home, a uh, traditional home uh, that you would think of. So the way I kind of want to frame the, the discussion here is, and the thing I sort of want people to take away from, uh, given the amount of changes that are happening in the world and, and the economy, you know, is COVID-19 a change or is it an acceleration of previous trends? And you'll see pretty clearly, I think, in a couple slides that I think it's the latter, not, not the former. But if we go to the next slide, Roy. Um, so clearly, you know, there's been a lot of headlines about different markets. I included some of them. Uh, my favorite being the New York Post, uh, which said <laughs> middle class rich people, uh, which I'm not entirely sure what that means. It's just the New York Post. But clearly, uh -huh. there's been a lot, of, a lot of headlines and there's been a lot of news. And so I think the next couple slides, I'm just hoping to disentangle that and let everyone know kind of what the data actually suggests. So we go to the next slide. So the median home sales price uh, was about... 7.7% higher in Q1 over, over last year this time. Uh, you can see on this slide, it's broken down by, by geography, uh, the Northeast uh, outperformed. But I think what's really important to take away here is this is, this is pretty significant price appreciation on a year over year basis. Um, this is also the median home sale. So if you look on the left-hand side of the chart, you see the dollar sign. Um, so the median home is somewhere between 250 and, and, and $400,000, depending on what geography you're in. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the most common home, not the high end, not the low end, the, you know, the median. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see 
uh, a couple cities, obviously the, the national average or the regional average is one thing. When you go one layer below that, you actually start to look at individual cities, um, especially ones that perhaps people who are on the call live in or are familiar with. Um, I mean, some of the numbers are, are, are pretty astounding, quite frankly. Um, I mean, you can see here, Colorado Springs had over 14% appreciation. Uh, you know, New York and New Jersey, Newark metro area had 8% appreciation. Uh, uh, Naples and, and Marco Island had about 12% appreciation. So, you know, when you look under the hood of the regional numbers, some of these particular cities are got got quite a lot of, uh, you know, appreciation uh, in the last well, well, What we're seeing now, Hardy, is, is that uh, the velocity of, of home sales is decreasing, so they're less listing. And so that's now creating effectively a, a seller's market because a lot of folks are hunkering down uh, and they're, they're not prepared to make a move. They'd rather not. You know, they just want to wait till, till things settle down a little bit. And so you actually, uh, you know, and also people are, are concerned about having people marching through their home, uh, you know, to, to show a home. And so uh, a lot of realtor friends we have while they're using videos and doing the best we can, we're seeing uh, far less listings than, than we have in the past. Absolutely. So Absolutely. That, that is going to create some additional pricing acceleration, I, I would think. Yeah. And when, it's, when we're back to business as usual, uh, you know, I think listings and tours will definitely be up uh, quite a bit. So if we go to the next just, slide. Yep. Just just keep the volume up, Artie, if you could. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. I apologize. I'll, I'll speak. Uh, and then, and then uh, about, and this is a good slide on, on mortgages. Could you proceed with that if you could? Yeah. So the idea here is that, you know, granular data is sort of difficult to come by. So I want to show it a couple of different ways to talk about sort of what is demand like right now. This is this chart shows mortgage applications for new homes. So new mortgages, not refinancing. Um, and you can see there it's a little small, but it ticks up, uh, you know, going into the crisis. Uh, that's really related to the change in interest rates, I believe, goes way down as the crisis hits. You know, essentially no one was, was purchasing a home for the first couple of weeks to, you know, to a month. But we've seen a dramatic rebound um, just, uh, you know, the last bit. I think what's important here to note is that that V-shape or that spike is now sort of normalizing and trending down. So on a week over week basis, which is very noisy, and I wouldn't put too much stock into the data on a weekly basis, but just for information, on a week over week basis, the applications number came down 4%. So I think the idea is it's gonna spike and then sort of just normalize uh, a little bit. Um, by of contrast, course, if we, add, if, if we do add the refis, you know, it, it's, it's, it's about as much as the banks can process. In fact, there was a period of time in the middle of COVID that the banks were increasing their interest rates because they couldn't deal with the flow of, of applications. Uh, and so they, want, they had to just artificially increase yep. the rates in order to slow yeah. the, the, uh, the application process. Yeah. Absolutely, so I, I think that data is very noisy. It doesn't tell you too much about price appreciation, so I, I didn't include the refi, but you can, you can see that data also. Right. Uh, if we go to the uh, next slide, commercial, commercial real estate. Okay, okay. Well, before we do oh, that, we have a uh, I wanna go, Artie, I wanna go to the next poll before we go to commercial sure. real estate, and I, I lead you right into it. At, as of May, how much has commercial real estate, retail and office decreased it's multiple choice, 3%, 6%, 11%, or 14%. And this, is, and this is value, just to be clear. It's the, the value overall, not the... The, the, va not the value, price. right. Yeah. And we got a few people saying 11, a few people, said, about half of you saying 14, and a few people saying 6. And uh, like you said, 14%, but the answer is 11%. 11% is... Yeah, and I think that the numbers I showed you about sort of median home price, uh, those are pretty strong numbers in a vacuum. But when you compare it to what's happening in commercial real estate, where property prices increased dramatically from 09 and have now gone down uh, double digits, I think that's sort of an important relative basis to, to look at how residential is performing. Um, so this, this chart comes from Green Street Advisors. So it's, a, it's an overall macro view of all commercial real estate, which would include office, retail, you know, urban, industrial, all that, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. So if you, if you take out industrial, it probably, retail and office probably dropped even more than 11%. So the folks who said 14% may actually be right. Yeah, and you can look at, you can look at some of the public, public equities as a proxy for malls and some retail names, which are down, you know, 20 to 50% until recently. Okay. Last couple of weeks have been different, but. Um, I think it is, the, I mean, one great takeaway from this is that clearly we're seeing that the residential single family uh, uh, construct, whether it's going to be for rentals or, or if you're owning the house to, you know, to yourself, is an area that, that isn't being hit as hard as the other parts of, of the real estate uh, 
market itself. And I think that's right. something that we're starting to see. And, and at the end, we'll talk about sort of whether we think that trend will, will continue or not. So I think that's a question. So um, just last one on sort of like the very recent day-to-day uh, -day, uh, action. If we can go to the next slide. Um, this is Redfin, which generally has pretty good data. Um, this is a somewhat squishy number, but it's essentially how many people were reaching out to Redfin, um, you know, online, talking to an agent, putting in offers. It's sort of their, their aggregate demand index. Um, and like, like I showed you on the, um, it follows essentially the mortgage uh, purchase applications, uh, you know, goes down, spikes. Uh, this data is as of May 17th, so I'll be looking for the next update. I am guessing that that number starts to come down a little bit, but is still elevated sort of relatively. Um, and just to make it clear that on that previous one, so 100 on that, just to, just to note this, 100 uh, is the seasonally, uh, is, this, is, is the, um, it's fixed to January, February of 2020. So we're actually above, well above January, February, sort of normal. Right. Right. Next slide. Yeah, so the next, the next couple slides, so look, big picture, let's take a step back because I don't want to get too in the weeds. So you've see, sort of seen real estate prices diverge from commercial and residential. And so the next couple of things I want to point out to folks are what was the story about residential real estate, broadly speaking, going into the crisis? Uh, Roy, as you mentioned, I know you were very involved in 09 and the restructuring. Um, but as I think as a consequence of what happened in the last crisis and really residential real estate being kind of the culprit or the core one of the core drivers of the financial crisis, it you know, was the core driver of the financial crisis, um, things actually were not overheated particularly. So these charts come from the Federal Reserve, which I think is an important, uh, you know, an important body in, in these discussions. And you know, if you look at the chart on the left, home appreciation from sort of 2014 um, has essentially been stable. So homes have not been appreciating this is this is percentage on a year over year basis. So appreciating somewhere around 5% a year. But you know, it's not dramatically trending upwards. There's no sort of, um, you know, exponential uh, growth happening there. On the right hand side, this is a price to rent ratio. I'm essentially looking at how much is a home cost versus renting. Um, and the Fed is also telling us here that it's essentially at the long term average. So home prices are not particularly elevated, um, you know, on a sort of macro kind of longer term view. Um, if we head to the, I mean, if we look at that huge spike in in twenty, in you know in two thousand and nine or two, I guess uh, two thousand and seven, you see that that iceberg, you know, just just yeah. popping up. What, it went it went vertical. So uh, that's that's very unlike I think you know anything that we've seen. Uh, I think we've seen since. So 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 um, what do you what is I mean so what does that mean to an individual? It means that that the price of a home was was much more expensive than the cost to rent. Is that what we're saying there during that period? Um, it, yes, essentially that, you know, the, 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 the price of buying was elevated and they've, and they've fixed it. Uh, the right hand side is just a, is just a proxy number. So it, you know, it got much more expensive to buy a home, uh, than to rent. So, so that's essentially what we're saying in 2009. Right. But so today, now we go out to 2020 and we see that the two have, have come back into somewhat equilibrium. Yeah. Home prices are not particularly elevated over, over rent off, renting. Exactly. Um, and if we, if we look here, I mean, going into this crisis, when I say pre-crisis, I mean the, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, on the left-hand side, this is data that also from the Fed. Oh, sorry, if we could go. Forward. I want to do a question first. Oh, I think oh, sure. there's a question and I want to give the answer. Sure. Here we go. What percent of homes had negative equity at the end of 2019? And, 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 that, and this is important. What percent of homes had negative equity, meaning they were upside down, meaning that the house was worth less than the mortgage in 2019. And how many people had no equity in their homes, you know, before COVID? Uh, and most of you got it right. 56% said 10%. Uh, some of you said 15, some said 20. But the answer is 10%. They really almost all homeowners uh, had some equity in their home, except for about 10%. Now that we thought was going to change dramatically with COVID, but as we're seeing, except for people who can't pay their mortgage because they're unemployed, we're not seeing a devaluation in the, in the housing stock that, that was the pre, which was the major, major component of, of, of the bubble and of last, the crisis last time. We had this artificial bubble that we saw where homes were far more valued than the rental value. And therefore people saying, shoot, you know, I might as well just rent my home somewhere else because it would be cheaper. So if I got rid of my home, I could rent the same home across the street. And in fact, we did that. <laughs> Artie, we actually did that. We had people give up their home 
and rent the home across the street and they, they were paying less or they ended up renting their same home from the bank for less than their mortgage. But we're not seeing that in this crisis. Anyway, I thought that was very important. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And I had this on a bullet. I didn't mention it. I mean, delinquencies have ticked up um, since Corona started. They're at about 8.5% now um, is, the, is, the, is the most recent data. Um, but that being said, even if it ticks up a lot, given that it was trending down for years and years, um, from a leverage and a debt perspective, uh, there's a lot of equity in most homes. Um, and just contrast that with an arena like hotel or office today where you had people borrowing, depending on where you were, 60 to 80% of value, values come down 20 to 40%, depending on what kind of asset you own. And actually you might have way too much debt on some of those assets. So, so anecdotally, that's funny. You know, uh, when we were doing foreclosure defense, it was for a, they were the cottage industry or for, of law firms that all they were doing were bringing foreclosures and they were huge and they had hundreds and hundreds of lawyers. Most of those lawyers have been laid off at the beginning of COVID and they're not being brought back anytime soon because they're, while there, there could be an onslaught of some foreclosures for people who've lost their job, the reality is because you have equity in your home, you can still do a modification. You still can do a short sale. You could sell it. You don't have to do a short sale. You just do a regular sale because you have equity in the home. And because of that, there are going to be so many more opportunities to negotiate with your bank because your bank knows you got equity. And so they're willing to work with you and ride with you. Unlike last time where the, the property had lost so much value, they had to get you out and just re recalibrate that, 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 that value of the home. Absolutely. And remember, the home prices have been appreciating, you know, at least in the last quarter. So, you know, even if there's something that might be in trouble today, if you sort of wait two quarters and we continue to see growth, there might be some additional equity. I'm cognizant, I'm cognizant of time, so I just want to get through the next couple ones a little bit quicker. Um, this, I think, is probably the most important chart. And for this, the rest of the, the slides, we'll be talking about sort of single family rental. Everything previous was just the housing market in general. So I think this is by far the most important chart. I've called it my favorite chart in the world. I think it explains a lot of... Uh, our society uh, and, and our world. Um, this is uh, age of U.S. population by, by age. This is from the 2018 census, so you got to kind of pull the numbers forward two years. But look, what does this suggest? The most, the modal age in the U.S. is around 29 years old. Uh, I'm in my early 30s, uh, as is uh, Mel, Roy's daughter, who, who uh, was a very good friend of mine. Um, you know, we are, I think the term millennial is a little, is a little disingenuous or it's not accurate. I, I prefer to call us the echo boomers. Uh, so the baby boomers all had children. We are their children. Those are the echo boomers. And you can just see there's about 500,000, roughly 500,000 more echo boomers um, than there are people who are 10 years older. So if you just look sort of eyeball it, there's about 4.5 million 25 year olds. And, uh, you know, there's something closer to kind of like four and a quarter uh, you know, 40, 40 year olds. Um, and so I think that's, that, that has huge effects for the whole broader economy, but specifically housing, which we'll, which we'll talk more about. So um, what's driving sort of the single family rental market? Uh, it's really a lot of millennials and, and echo boomers uh, and household formation specifically. So household formation is a fancy term for, um, you know, uh, finding your partner in life, uh, getting engaged uh, and, and hopefully married. Um, and then the sort of the natural or the next logical thing to do is, uh, you know, to, to have children. Um, and as a consequence of having children, that's, you know, you're now, you're now a full household. So uh, in terms of historical numbers, uh, households in the U.S. have increased by about 1% every single year um, from 1990 uh, through the end of the year. Um, and so when you look at that cohort of the average 29-year-old, um, you know, or the, the, the median sort of late 20s person, um, you know, we think there's going to be a pretty big increase in household formation uh, going forward. And Roy, you've asked a question, so I'll let you. I'll let you. Well, it's, it's just a continuation of, of this whole notion of household formation. You know, what two states um, are creating more households than any other two states in the nation? In some cases, more than an entire region. And uh, it's 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 not a trick question, but it, it, it and it's partially intuitive, but not fully intuitive. Um, Many of you, uh, like myself, uh, would have thought that California was one of those two states. In fact, over half of you think California is in one of those two states. Well, it's not. Many of you think, or a few of you think that New York may be one of those two states. Well, it's not. And so when you're down to it, you're down to Florida and Texas. I'm happy you got that right. So if we go to the next slide, Artie, uh, you can explain. Yeah, this is essentially the same, the same data just shown geographically. I think the key takeaway here is um, people are moving to lower cost places. Um, and so the Southeast, Texas, and Southwest, 
I think are all benefiting from, you know, shifts in population, uh, folks moving from New York to, to Florida uh, or California to, to Texas. And, you know, let's talk about Corona in this context. I mean, we're, we've all been working from home for four months. I think that is a new feature of the, you know, of our economy that you can really sort of pick your, pick where you want to work from uh, in many cases. And so these, honestly, this data is probably not even up to date. I, I, I think we'll probably even be more strongly in favor of Texas and the Southwest. Right. So, uh, but data. clearly the, the virus is going to accelerate another trend of Florida and Texas uh, being hot places for people to move. And, and I'm not trying to, to be punny here, but it's hot because <laughs> the virus, regardless, uh, does better under UV high vitamin D conditions. Uh, right. Most of the folks who ended up in New York City hospitals had vitamin D deficiencies. Now, you could argue that the disease caused the deficiency or they came in with the disease uh, with low vitamin D. But the reality is, is that many folks in New York and, and in Boston and other cities like Philadelphia and D.C. are vitamin D deficient because of the weather. And so what we're seeing is that people are chasing the sun as they have done for millennia, you know, for, for, for thousands of years. And so we're going to continue to see that, that going on. Uh, uh, sure. And so, um, so we'll, we'll get. I want to leave some time at the end because I know we we have questions and stuff. So, um, if we could just hop to the to the next uh, the next slide. So, okay. So in this context, you've kind of got a lot of echo boomers. You sort of have home prices seem to be doing well coming out of Corona. So, kind of this makes sense. Everybody's going to buy a home, right? This is sort of be a logical conclusion. Um, when you actually get into the numbers, though, and I apologize that the numbers on the right hand chart didn't actually come through. I, I'll I'll verbalize them for you. Um, you know, home ownership is still a very expensive endeavor. And so if you just look on the left, you know, depending on where you are and what you're buying, you know, it costs anywhere between 25 to even a hundred plus thousand dollars um, just to actually, you know, put your down payment, closing costs and actually close on a home. If you remember the median home price, I mean, median home prices are sort of around 300,000 big picture. Um, so this is still a significant amount of money you need just to buy the median home. Um, on the right-hand side, what this would have shown, apologies for the, for the formatting uh, uh, snafu, but essentially those same folks that we were talking about before um, have very limited net worth. So the left-hand chart, uh, the left-hand bar, sorry, the smallest bar um, is net worth among under 35, which I could have done this as a poll question. It's $4,700. So under 35-year-olds have very limited net worth, again, as a consequence of some of the other things that are happening in our economy. But simply the idea of shelling out $100,000 sort of on your own is not, is not super plausible. Um, if and, and, the, and the reality is, is that the last economic recession set back those families dramatically, where in the past, you know, a gift letter was typical. You know, as you know, we, we have a title company that's done thousands and thousands of closings. You know, typically we would always see gift letters from parents and grandparents when people were buying their first homes. And it was very customary to see that. We see less and less of that today. Oh, interesting. Did 15 years ago. And the reason for that is many people's net worth never got restored after the Great Recession. Many families didn't. And so uh, a lot of these folks who are coming of age, you know, are concerned about uh, tying up their, their house, their, their primary capital in a house when in fact they saw what happened to their parents uh, when they got caught in, in, in the last bubble. We have two questions here, Artie. Let me, let me ask sure. them. One is, doesn't the data change based on geographic markets and also level of income? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, uh, $75,000 uh, in suburban New York, uh, you know, <laughs> barely, barely gets you a, a touring. Uh, so yeah, clearly where you are matters a huge amount. Your income level matters a huge amount. Um, it, but it is fundamentally, I mean, net worth is fundamentally related to age and number of years in the workforce. So all things being equal, if you're 40, you've got 10 extra years in the workforce. And someone who's who's 30 and the you know the liquidity and net worth will show that and, and this is a great question this may be the ten thousand dollar question would this be a good time to rent or buy an apartment in an urban area given that the population may move out of big cities i, I would say this is a good time to buy a, a place in an in an urban center that, that that's been hit hard by people moving out to the first yeah I, I wish i could say this is above my pay grade but uh this is my job so um i have i have some views and i think that um, you know, at least the way uh, our firm has chosen uh, thus far to make that to make that investment is really by looking into the single family market, which is actually the next slide. So I'll talk about sort of single family rental and why single family rental is kind of the solution to this problem. I realize that's not a great answer, but 
it's a it's a difficult question. So I'll add to that. I, I think that cities have to hit rock bottom before that opportunity presents itself, and at that point, you will have unique opportunities. But uh, you know, cities have not hit rock bottom by any stretch of the imagination. I pray they don't, but to the extent they do, that's when the vulture, that's when the investors will will come in. So. You know, I would only do it because you want to live in the city. You want that urban life, and that's something you've always wanted. I wouldn't do it because you think it's a good investment. Um, so single-family rental, and again, apologies, we, we, we lost some of the formatting, but uh, SFR is really the natural choice, um, given the previous slides and everything that's going on with price and cost and, and needs. Um, so what this actually shows is that um, the left-hand most is the basically essentially apartments really only have two or fewer bedrooms. Uh, the, the going right from the leftmost is three, four, and five. And so you can see actually the apartments, which are in the lighter color. Um, essentially, big picture, very few apartments have three, four, and five bedrooms. And that makes complete sense because if you've ever invested in or done a deal for an urban apartment, the economics of that third bedroom, it takes you know, just as much space and you're not able to charge the same percentage rent. So think of this in the sense of a two bedroom will go for 2000, um, you know, a three bedroom is, no one's gonna pay you 3000, they'll pay you 2600 or 2500. Um, so the unit economics of the third bedroom and that square footage brings your overall rent price per square foot down. So as a consequence, what do families do? Families go to homes. And that's what the chart on the bottom shows. Um, only 48% of families in the US actually choose apartments. Um, about the other half, uh, more or less, live in homes. By contrast, non-family renters are about 71% in apartments. And that makes complete sense. You're living alone or you have a roommate or two. Um, you know, you're not, you're not looking for a three or four bedroom. Um, uh, I guess we'll go to the next question. What percent of the rental housing stock was built after the year 2000? 10%, 15%, 20%, or 25%? What percent of the rental housing stock was built after the year 2000? And, and this was uh, an interesting question. 10%, uh, only 5% said, said that, 15% said it was 30%, and a uh, number of you thought it was 25%. Most of you thought it was 20%. The reality is that most of the rental housing stock, and Artie, I'll let you give it, everyone the real answer to that. Um, if we just head to the next slide, um, well, I'll voice, I'll voice the, the numbers. So I think the key, the key metric here is that only about 15% of single family rental homes are from 2000 or later. And I'm sure most folks here either can know their own homes or their parents' homes. And you sort of know that a home built in 2005 is very different than a home built in 1975. Um, but just to take that number in 1975, about a quarter of all single family uh, was built between 1960 and 1980. And just think about all the changes that we've, that have taken place, you know, from working from home, the most recent, all the way to uh, my, my wife's favorite, which is the garbage disposal. Um, and there's just been tremendous changes, but the housing stock is actually, is actually very old, um, is really the, the takeaway. Um, so we don't really have, uh, in the same way that we have in a lot of downtown areas, a lot of new, a lot of new building uh, in single family. Uh, on slide forty, uh, Artie, on that slide, yep. slide forty one, uh, there was something I cut off. Maybe you could. Uh, yeah, what? I, I, it's a, it's going to be a little tougher. Right? Maybe we could just. I think the, the general point is sort of that. You know, okay. Okay. We made it. Out. Okay. Yeah. Great. And this um, and this so, is where the answer is to the question. Yeah. This is sort of. I think this is you know sort of the key takeaway on SFR specifically. Um, single family rental is a very small part of the overall housing. Um, market. Um, so you have about 124 million housing units in the U.S. Uh, that's the left-hand uh, pie. Um, that gets converted to about 47 million rental housing units. Um, the dark blue is SFR as well. Um, and then you end up with about uh, 16 million SFR units. Um, so what does that actually mean? I mean, I'm sort of throwing numbers at you. But essentially, the single-family rental market is actually um, very small relative to the overall aggregate size of the U.S. housing market, which, as everyone knows, is one of, one of if not the biggest asset class in the whole world, it's trillions and trillions of dollars. The specific number of single-family rental product is very small. And, and just the way to think about this is there's a couple of publicly traded 
uh, names, the aggregate market cap for those is roughly around $25 billion of aggregate market cap for single family rental. Um, you have technology companies pushing a trillion and obviously many other types of companies um, well above that. But if you were to look at the, that number relative to the overall size of the market, it's actually still small. So this asset class is still pretty tiny and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's part of a pretty big. So, uh, so of the 124 million total housing units, uh, 47 million are, are rental housing. So that's around 20%, right? Give it a little, uh, what, a little more, 12, 24, about, to, about 40%, right? Roughly, yeah. And then of that 40%, uh, 16 million are, are, are units that are owned uh, by, uh, by third parties. And so now let's go to our next question. And what percent are those single family rentals own third parties institutions? 2%, 5%, 40%, or 50%? Yeah, an institution would be a non, you know, a, a professional real estate owner who is part of a company, right. not just an individual right. yeah. owning. The great irony for those of you who've been watching this real carefully, the answer was on the slide in front of you, but it was buried. So uh, we actually, this was an open book test, and let's see how many of you fail. And the answer is, Virtually all of you intuitively, it is hard for us to believe that only 2% of the housing stock is owned by institutions. Uh, now you have third parties that do own it, mom and pops, but only 2% of it is owned by institutions. So 15% of you got that right. And most of you took the sucker answer, which was 40%, and it's not that. Most homes are still owned by, by individuals or, or by small groups and that this is just an area that Wall Street has, has shied away from until now. But as Ardavan can explain, this is something that, that big, big, big money is now pouring into. Yeah, and I think the thing to say here is that um, what's the difference between an institutional owner and a mom and pop? Well, an institutional owner has economies of scale, right? They have a management company. They can do maintenance better. They can do all that stuff better. Um, they can market better. Um, you know, they can price things better because that's their job. And so I think as you start to see more institutional ownership, less mom and pop ownership, as we've seen, by the way, in, you know, once upon a time, retail used to be owned by the retailer, right? You were selling hats or something, you know, in downtown New York and you owned your real estate. And then those two things separated and the retailer became JCPenney and the landlord became, you know, Seritage or another, or another real estate company. So I think you're going to start to see that bifurcation. Uh, it's already happening clearly, but um, we'll, we'll continue. Um, just cognizant of time, if we could just skip maybe to the very last, we'll, sk we'll skip the starts. This is the last thing I just want to mention for everybody. Um, we only have, this is total housing supply in the U.S. Um, you know, we only have about five months of supply based, or sorry, six months of supply based on the May 2020 numbers. Um, if you just look at what was happening around the recession and the, and the, and the, and the financial crisis, I mean, we ticked all the way up to, you know, 9, 10, 12 months. Um, before things corrected. So housing supply in general is fairly limited. Um, and by the way, that's just the May number. So if you think that your you know, numerator is going up, the denominator here uh, will, will, will come down as well. So we could be in a situation potentially where housing supply overall in the country is actually gets even tighter than it is. And, and I know that the new housing, I mean, the, the companies that are building new houses are doing remarkably well on Wall Street. So it may suggest that, that they are, uh, don't even have enough supply for those people who want to buy home, single family homes right now. And yeah, it's very it's very early to tell but the it's very early to tell but the anic data the anic data suggests that you know those guys are running out of inventory especially at lower price points you know around the median price point their inventory is is pretty tight. And what we've also talked about is that the single family home is going to be redesigned to create uh, office nooks places where people can work and almost create like their own workstation. It doesn't have to be an entire room there'll be a workstation where they, where they can work uh, from home and, and be able to Zoom and, and, and have a sense of, of, of differentiality between where they're working in their home and, and the home that they use for their home. And, and I think you know, the, the apartment, the two bedroom cookie cutter apartment just does not accommodate that kind of permanent living condition. Sure. Um, and then just to wrap it up uh, real quickly, uh, you know, what the, there are a lot of known unknowns. Um, uh, Oh, we can go to the, the, the very last slide questions. Um, there are a lot of known unknowns. So, you know, household formation is, is a great example. Typically in a recession, household formation goes down. I mean, I was invited to 11 weddings this year, uh, all of which uh, have sort of been pushed to 2021, but we'll sort of see what happens with household formation. I think 
work from home is another great example. You know, are we going to be going to the office, you know, three days a week or one week a month? I think those are some questions to be answered. Um, you know, the uh, housing supply, right? If builders really sort of see the demand out in the market and they, and they bring, especially given unemployment levels, folks can generally move into construction. It's actually one of the best uh, employment sectors of our economy who can move into construction. Maybe you're working on the oil patch in Texas and now you're actually have a construction job. Um, so maybe we could actually build a, a lot quicker to meet demand than in previous cycles. So, so there's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of questions still, so, but I hope this was helpful just to give people a, a sense. Arnie, there's one question that, that, that people have and, and, and it probably is self-evident to you, but not to everyone. Why is single family rentals a better deal and how is, is, is that created for the tenant by the institution? Sure. So, uh, the, uh, be better deal in which sense, fi financially or from a yeah, better deal. Why? I mean, I'm, we know we, we talked about the down payment, but why does it work? Why, why does single family rental work for, for a tenant? Oh, sure. So, uh, well, let's talk numbers and let's just talk like lifestyle numbers wise. Um, generally single family is around the same price as a uh, multifamily. So, and that's really has to do mostly with the price of land and the price of construction. So to build a home in a suburb of, I'm gonna pick this name out of a hat, Austin, Texas. You know, if you wanna buy land in downtown Austin and build an apartment building, and again, I don't have specific data, I'm, I'm making these numbers up, but bear with me. You know, you're gonna end up paying $500,000 per unit to build a new multifamily building in Austin. So the rent you're gonna to have to charge to recoup a decent investment on your 500,000 per unit is gonna to have to be X. Well, if you can build a three bedroom home in the suburbs of Austin, because your land price is lower and maybe construction costs is lower, you can build it for 350,000. You can afford to charge a lower rent or the same rent essentially for a bigger space. So from a microeconomic perspective, uh, you know, it's cheaper housing than downtown urban amenitized, you know, multifamily. From a consumer perspective of like, why would you do this as a lifestyle choice? Um, you know, it gives you flexibility. You have the ability to uh, have a one-year lease or a two-year lease. You're not buying yourself into, you know, a, a large asset that you're taking leverage on by a mortgage. Um, and it's a low maintenance lifestyle. I mean, you know, most folks, especially, I didn't mention this, but especially in the echo boomer and millennial generation are two, are two, two working parents, uh, myself and my wife. I know uh, uh, Roy, your kids as well. Um, so, you know, if both people are working, the amount of maintenance that's required just to manage a home um, is sort of a is sort of a product of a previous era. Um, nobody really has that much time to coordinate maintenance and you know landscaping and all that stuff. I'd I'd rather, and I think a lot of people would rather simply just pay a small fee to a landlord to manage all of that for you, so you can focus and spend your time on what's important with your family. And, your and they may be able to do it cheaper because there are economies of scale that are involved. If they're doing it for fifty, a hundred, or five hundred homes, as opposed to you doing it just for your house. Yeah. The other thing is the carry on the house. You know, the 30 year mortgage is not the most efficient way for someone to finance a home. And, and for political and socioeconomic reasons, it's been around for a long time. But even, even uh, Greenspan, when he was the Federal Reserve Chairman, he complained that people were wasting their money on, on fixing their homes at 30 years because they weren't going to live there 30 years. And so they were paying insurance and they were paying for, for something that they were never going to use. And, and if uh, you have large institutions that are going to own these homes, obviously they're going to be able to be able to carry that asset at a much lower lower interest rate. I didn't know that about Greenspan. That's, I'll have to find that quote. That's helpful. Oh yeah, yeah, you said that years ago. Um, I think we're running out of time. Are there any more questions or not? There are no more questions. Artie from Cambia Management, I want to thank you. Uh, you've been great and uh, you know, we really appreciate you joining us. Uh, again, everyone from Thanks Western Title, Oppenheim Law, we want to thank you for those of you, uh, your first time, just so you know, we're, we're here to, to assist you in, in every way possible, whether it's dealing with COVID or whether it's dealing with acquiring your dream home or even renting a home from an institutional uh, landlord. Uh, we will review those, those options with, with, with you too. Uh, you all know how to reach us. Uh, and so Zoom at noon, Roy Oppenheim, again, on behalf of Artivan and, and everyone at Oppenheim Law, I want to thank you for joining us today. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Roy. Really appreciate it. Take care. Bye.